All right. We are live, Reggie, um, on, uh, as you called it before, Preservation Maryland TV. <laughs> um, and um, we are excited to have you here today with us. I'm Nick Redding. I'm the Executive Director of Preservation Maryland. And I am joined by uh, Reggie Turner, who wears many different hats. Um, and he is a local businessman, community activist, historian, volleyball dad. Uh, he does <laughs> a lot of different, he plays a lot of different important roles. And we're going to be talking today about um, our operations here at Preservation Maryland and the ongoing um, programmatic support that we're providing across the board. Um, we've been fortunate that because of donor uh, generosity and support, we've been able to continue our operations in a big way. And today we're announcing not only that we're continuing to do that work uh, at the advocacy, outreach, funding, education side, um, but that we're doubling down and we're investing um, in one of our programs in our historic property redevelopment program. Um, but before I go on too long, as I'm known to do, um, I want to talk a little bit to our guest here who we have with us today. Um, who maybe some folks at Preservation Maryland and our members and donors don't know yet, but hopefully you'll know more of uh, soon. So Reggie, um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Who are you? Where you come from? And, uh, you know, obviously you have a passion for history. Is that something you've always had? Yes, it is. Uh, my tagline is um, I'm a small town country boy from Appomattox, Virginia. Um, so uh, history has always been something that's very important to me. Um, my family's home is pretty much catty corners from an old Civil War church. Um, and um, my family and I, we own a significant amount of land around that church. So um, running through those woods uh, for, for years and years and uh, learning the history of the Civil War and the role that that my ancestors played and that has always been something that's important to me. Um, I live here in Hagerstown, Maryland. Uh, I am a financial advisor by trade for 20 years. I founded Turner Wealth Management back in 2018. Uh, I serve on the Maryland Commission of African American History and Culture. I was appointed by Governor Hogan in 2017. Uh, here in my community, I serve on various boards as well. Uh, I'm a father of three, um, uh, 20, 14, and 11-year-old girls, so uh, my hands are full, um, but I'm enjoying this time that we have uh, when they're all in the house together, so um, with the five of us, uh, including my wife, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty unique time, but we are finding our ways to find joy in that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we are um, going to talk a little bit about and sort of zero in on Hagerstown and in a specific place in Hagerstown um, and talk a little bit about how you and I kind of started working together. It's been a partnership for the better part of like a year and a half now. Um, and one of the first emails I received from you um, as I do so often from different people around the state was, oh my gosh, something is about to be knocked over. Um, we desperately need your help. And oftentimes in that moment of despair, we're not terribly helpful because preservation is, it, it, it's, it's a best when it's a proactive game. Uh, we don't play a good reactive game like a lot of people. Uh, you're an investor. I think proactive investing is probably better than reactive investing, right? Absolutely. And so, um, so we've been engaged for the better part of, as it, for a year and a half in a specific neighborhood in Hagerstown called Jonathan Street, um, which is the traditionally African-American neighborhood going back a very long way. Probably one of the, we kind of figure one of the three oldest established African-American communities in the state. Yeah. Um, and and by, by extension, then one of the oldest established African-American communities really in the country. Um, but for people who aren't familiar with Hagerstown, um, you want to tell us a little bit about what the community is and um, maybe describe, you know, size, location, 
history, what, what, what makes Hagerstown matter and, and what kind of a place is it to live in? Sure. Uh, well, Hagerstown is in Western Maryland and Washington County, Maryland. Um, population is roughly about 40,000. Um, we are right at the intersection of Interstate 81 and 70. Um, Hagerstown is known as the hub city um, and that dates back to its industrial core. Um, Hagerstown was founded in 1762. Uh, broader out looking at Washington County, um, you have here Antietam Battlefield that has, that sees over 300,000 tourists each year. Um, within the core of Hagerstown, you have attractions such as the Maryland Theater, which has been um, newly revamped uh, and opened in October. Uh, you have cultural trails, you have the Museum of Fine Arts, you have the Maryland Symphony Orchestra, um, you have shopping. Uh, we're about 63 miles from Washington, D.C. Um, also within the court in the Jonathan Street community, you have the Ruth Ann Monroe Basketball League. So being a former athlete, um, that's near and dear to me. That league has been in existence for, I believe, 50 to 60 years. Um, and it's quite the place to be to see young kids enjoying the game of basketball during the summer here in Hagerstown. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a unique place and it has has so much going for it. And, and even in the past several years, there's been a real renaissance in Hagerstown um, that perhaps people elsewhere in the state aren't aware of, but just so much private and public investment going into downtown. And now it's time to figure out how, in my perspective, and I know you share this as well, how to, to spread that wealth and how to spread that um, renaissance to the neighborhoods that surround downtown. And some of them have benefited greatly. Jonathan Street has been a place that has received a lot of disinvestment, has traditionally been overlooked um, and through segregation and then desegregation and some government policy decisions. Um, Jonathan Street, like a lot of red line communities has suffered. Um, you wanna talk about Jonathan Street, kind of give people just the basics of um, the history there and why that place matters to the African-American community? The historic Jonathan Street community is roughly about two by five blocks, um, roughly speaking. Um, that community, African-Americans have been in that community since the late 1700s. Um, it's the home of six historically uh, historic black churches uh, within the community, so really community um, focused place. Um, I, I think one of the things that has excited me and intrigued me about the Jonathan Street community, um, Jonathan Street community previously was its own version of Black Wall Street. Um, it, it was a place of business and commerce where you had um, multiple businesses there um, over periods of time. Uh, in some of the research that historians have done they estimate that Jonathan Street was at his peak um, after the turn of the century in the early 1900s, before it hit the Great Depression in regards to businesses. Um, there was a resurgence of those businesses after we came out of the Great Depression, and there's still, um, before the Civil Rights Act, there were many, many businesses there. And unfortunately, over time, with um, the moving of, of, the, of Route 11, the the state highway uh, and disinvestment within that community. Currently, there are no businesses. There are no African American businesses within that community. Yeah, um, and some of that has, as, as you know, has to do with zoning, and um, there's just been some policy changes that um, have been issues. Absolutely. Um, you know, one of the issues that was concerning to me when I first. Um, started to advocate for the community was that um, the city of Hagerstown is made up of four historic districts, um, but the Jonathan Street community is not included in that. Um, and that was, that was troublesome. And then looking at documentation from that era um, and the policies that were taking and the promises that were made to the community, um, that, that's part of why we stepped up our advocacy as we learn more about the history 
the rich history of this community, we knew that uh, it was important to work and save. And when I first contacted you, it was in regards to, you know, one particular home that we were trying right. to save in the 11th hour. And the first thing you said to me is, you know, the outcome of this building very well may not be good. We may be too late for that, but we may be right on time for the rest of the community. And that is starting to come to fruition. Yeah, it is. And, um, you know, one of the things that we learned in that process and that we've learned in many different processes is that um, sometimes one building's loss can be the catalyst um, to save other things because it kind of wakes people up. And and that building in particular, I mean, we've done some research and, and I know Lynn Bowman, um, a historian, has done a tremendous amount of work and has published a fantastic um, new book on Jonathan Street to kind of help really make the case and not make the case, but kind of explain why this place matters. You don't really have to make that case. It's, it's very clear, um, but sometimes in communities like this, um, it's been overlooked. And, um, you know, we've lost a series of Green Book sites. So for people that are familiar with the Green Book, um, which was a travel guide for African-Americans in the 20th century, there were places in Jonathan Street, there's a tea room, there's a hotel. Um, those places, unfortunately, have been lost. And the one that Reggie and I are talking about that has since been lost, even just in the past year, was the Moxley building, um, which is where the, the Moxley band uh, performed and practiced. And you want to give us just a little insight. Um, this is a little diversion, but it's pretty sure. cool what the Moxley band was. Uh, the Moxley band um, was a, originally a group, of, I believe it was 12 African Americans. Um, most of which were enslaved, some of them were free. It was uh, formed by three Moxley brothers. I believe one of them was free and the other two were enslaved. Um, this brass band performed in the Jonathan Street community um, before the Civil War. Um, and during the war, uh, two of the brothers gained their freedom um, by joining uh, the US colored troops. So the, the band joined the U.S. Colored Troops and then traveled um, from to Virginia, North Carolina, Texas, um, performed after the war. The members of the band returned to the Jonathan Street community and will perform in the evenings in, in Wheaton Park. Um, this band served this community for nearly 100 years. Um, it survived the first generation and moved on to a younger Moxley that ended up buying the property that we spoke of uh, where the band had performed in earlier years. Uh, even in the 1870s, the band performed when Frederick Douglass came to Hagerstown uh, uh, and, and paraded through the city. Uh, you know, through articles in the Afro-American newspaper, we've learned a lot in regards to kind of what that band's contributions were. Um, and individually, the Moxley brothers were, um, they were activists in the community. They were actively involved in the church. They were actively involved in different societies that were a part of the community. Um, so they were very, very influential in regards to the, the building and the growth of the community overall. Yeah, and I mean, unfortunately, the, the sad end of this story is that that building was lost. And, yeah. and, I, and you know, and, we obviously want to get to this announcement and what we're talking about here today and why we're, why we're um, reaching out to all of our donors here on Giving Tuesday now. And, and the hope is that donors will support this project, particularly once they hear what it is. Um, but, you know, we want to paint, I at least want to paint this picture um, because I've had the opportunity over the past year and a half to really get a sense for it myself. But for individuals not familiar with Hagerstown, not familiar with Jonathan Street, um, it might just seem like another neighborhood, another historic place. But it really has a tremendously rich history. I mean, to think to, that you could find a building where United States colored troops uh, were recruited out of for, you know, we don't know where a lot of US colored troops came from, particularly when it comes to the bands of the United States colored troops and where they performed. And, and then the history that Lynn has documented of them performing for Frederick Douglass and performing at different emancipation and Juneteenth uh, events throughout the whole really like three state region. Um, it's really just a tremendously rich story. And unfortunately, we've lost that building. The story can never be lost, right? 
But the right. building where that story um, really resonated and was rooted, unfortunately, has been lost. And we can't afford to lose anything more like that. Um, so I guess it's here that I kind of want to pivot um, and maybe recap just a little bit about where we're at and then, then talk about the, the, the project itself. But again, I'm Nick Redding. I'm the Executive Director of Preservation Maryland for those perhaps who have just joined us. And I'm joined by Reggie Turner, who um, is a businessman in the city of Hagerstown, but also a member of the state's um, African-American Heritage Commission um, and a local community activist and has been um, really a fantastic partner uh, along with his partner in crime, Terrence Moore, um, uh, which we have to give Terrence a shout out because he has been um, right along with us for all of this and is incredibly engaged in the local community along with a host of other folks. Um, but these two have really put Jonathan Street um, on a pedestal um, in the way that it, it deserves to be celebrated. So we've been working as Preservation Maryland with them. Again, this is a six to fix project that we've identified over the past year where we want to invest resources in this community and try and figure out how we can catalyze revitalization. Um, and you know, as this pandemic hit, a lot of nonprofits like Preservation Maryland have either been forced to curtail uh, programs or cut back or worse yet, lay off uh, staff. We fortunately, thanks to the generosity of our donors and the plans that we've put in place have been able to retain our staff. Um, we've been able to invest in our programs. Uh, we're gonna be announcing that uh, we're gonna be hosting our conference virtually this July. So there's gonna be a whole series of sessions over the uh, course of the month of July. Um, we have been producing our, our podcast, PreserveCast um, weekly. Um, we have a series of different grant programs that are going on. Um, and if that's not enough, um, we're excited now to announce that thanks to the work of Reggie, um, Terrence, and, and those who have gone before us, really, um, we um, are very excited to, to announce that we are planning for the acquisition at the end of the month of a historic structure on Jonathan Street. And this will be the first property acquisition for Preservation Maryland in 45 years. Um, so uh, it has been a long time coming and we are acquiring um, and have a contract to acquire a historic cabin on Jonathan Street, um, which we intend on doing some really cool things with and rehabilitating and honoring the legacy of this place and hoping to jumpstart this. Um, and I'm gonna pivot back to Reggie here in a second to talk about that building and maybe put up some pictures while he does that. But I wanna say that first and foremost, um, this would not have been possible without the generosity of the 1772 Foundation, which sort of re-sparked our revolving fund program. As I said, our program started back in the 1970s. Um, it actually started back in 1973. We went back into our records to try and figure out this story about how we started uh, a revolving fund. And the idea of a revolving fund is you buy a building, you rehab it, sell it to somebody else, and then recycle that capital to help save another historic structure. So it's been a long time since we've done that. Um, we were doing loans um, throughout the 80s and 90s and into the early 2000s, but actually buying a structure on our own is something we haven't done in a long time. Um, and it actually goes all the way back to 73. And then in 1974, Lee Adler, for those preservation fans out there, of historic Savannah fame, um, ended up coming to Baltimore and talking our board, then known as the Society for the Preservation of Maryland Antiquities, um, into doing something like this and creating a revolving fund. And it was a few years back now that 1772 Foundation stepped in, provided some seed funding to plan this out, look at how this would work. And we've been very thoughtful about what communities are we going to invest in? What kind of buildings are we going to invest in? And we want a building that tells an underrepresented story. Um, we've preserved a lot of mansions, but when it comes to cabins that tell the story of the everyday man, um, the farmer, the recently freed slave, <clears throat> the, you know, the freed African-American living in a slave state. Those are stories that deserve to be told. Um, buildings that are threatened, buildings that also um, could serve a rehabilitated purpose, 
and buildings that perhaps could jumpstart and catalyze redevelopment of a larger place. So we had a lot of different criteria and I'm, I'm pleased to say that this building met some of those. Reggie, I wanna turn it over to you to talk a little bit about this. And while you do that, I'm gonna try and pull up um, some pictures yeah. of this building so everybody can see what we're working on here. Sure. Well, this building is, um, to our knowledge, the oldest property within the Jonathan Street community. Uh, our records show that it was built in 1823. Um, so we are fast approaching 200 years um, of this um, of this structure. Um, also, we we believe that one of the societies within um, Hagerstown at the time um, had their headquarters out of this building, the Colored Laboring Sons and Daughters of the Beneficial Society of Hagerstown, uh, we believe used this as their headquarters. And um, when I talk to people about that organization, I, I basically explain it as this was the Jonathan Street Communities uh, United Way. Um, right, right, right. They took care of burials when families did not have the funds um, to be able to do so. They they raised money for the community in regards to the different needs of people within the community. And the members of this organization were, you know, the most influential African Americans within the community, such as uh, Jacob Wheaton. Um, who lived within the Jonathan Street community was the first African American to vote uh, in the state of Maryland. Um, so this this home holds significant history. Uh, we are, you know, we are very grateful for the owner and and his caregivers giving us the opportunity to be good stewards of this property and preserve it. Um, and I'm, I'm excited to see what is to come of this project and what we'll find as we uh, get the opportunity to rehab it. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about the, the project too. I was putting up some pictures there um, while you were talking and I might do that again so that people can kind of um, see what we're talking about here. Um, it is a, uh, a really a, a unique structure, as you say, we think it might be one of the oldest standing structures on Jonathan Street, perhaps even one of the oldest standing structures um, in the city of Hagerstown when it comes to log buildings. So this is just Jonathan Street that you're just kind of seeing here that one of the, the main corners, one of my favorite um, brick buildings there, with beautiful little pass through on the, the corner, um, sort of leading up to this. Um, this was prepared by our friends at Zigger Sneed um, architecture firm provided some pro bono services to start Kind of gives you an idea of where the building is located within the city of Hagerstown really right in the heart of um, really backing up almost to downtown. Um, this kind of gives you a sense for where the building is when it comes to Jonathan Street sort of right in a pretty intact area some portions of Jonathan Street have lost structures to demolition but this one. Um, is, in a, is in a pretty important place and close, as you say, to Wheaton Park, um, the Head Start Building, Recreation Center. So there's a lot going on in this area for the community. This, a, a, of course, is the building. Um, it's a, uh, might be described as a fixer upper, uh, needs a little bit of love, but that's what we do. We don't buy pretty buildings. We buy ones that need love. Um, it is a, a log structure, we think dating, and we're gonna do more research on this, probably to about 1830, um, somewhere in that area, era. These are, as, these are as built floor plans, just to kind of give you an idea for those architecture nerds out there who want a little bit more detail. Um, it is a very basic, very small floor plan. We're talking about probably less than 700 total square feet. Um, and one of our plans um, looks at potentially putting, and we'll talk a little bit about where this is headed and what this is gonna be used for, but potentially putting a small lean-to addition off the back where one historically stood. This is just the second floor. Um, it has a, uh, a pitch ceiling, not a lot of usable space up there, um, but, but there is a second floor. And this is the project team out there. So we've got architects, engineers, community folks, um, contractors, um, and uh, definitely want to thank the friends so far, which have included Zigger Sneed Architects, Simpson Gumpert, Gumpert's and Heger, um, so Ann Powell over at Zigger Sneed, 
um, Matt Dow um, at uh, SGH Engineering um, has been out to Jonathan Street many times now. Um, and our friends over at Worcester Eisenbrandt um, have also been extremely helpful um, in helping us figure out how much this whole, the whole project is going to cost. So um, just, a, just a couple of pictures to kind of whet everybody's appetite here. Um, I mentioned the 1772 Foundation kind of jump-started all of this. And I'm also pleased to report that the Middendorf Foundation, um, as well as the Rural Maryland Council, have really provided a lot of the funding, as well as the state of Maryland, to get this project off the ground. Our members are going to hear that we're still working to try and raise an additional $30,000 to not only make this program and this project a success, but really the overall revolving fund itself. Um, so there is a direct ask out there. We are raising money for a specific project, which is exciting. And again, revolving funds recycle the funds. So it's not often that you can give to a nonprofit and get the sense that the money that you're providing not only will help one project, but could help projects in perpetuity all across the state. Um, and that's what this historic property redevelopment program is doing. We're actually working and hope to announce some other projects in the future um, in different parts of the state. Um, so we love our friends in Hagerstown, but this will not be our only project. Um, and Reggie, do you want to talk at all about the CDC and sort of the catalytic side to this and why that has value with this project? Sure. Um, in looking at some of the properties that need um, rehabilitation within the Jonathan Street community and beyond. Um, uh, Terrence Moore and myself, we saw the need for an organization. Um, so we have developed the Western Maryland uh, Community Development Corporation with myself as the chairman, um, Terrence Moore, uh, Mitchell Branch, Scott Guillory, and Kenyatta Mason. And we are a collection of men that are businessmen. Um, some of us are from the community. Some of us are in plants like Ter uh, Terrence and myself. Um, you know, we have experience and, and, um, and talents within uh, consulting, wealth management, um, logistics, military. So we've combined all of our skills to form this corporation to start to uh, develop a plan to salvage these properties and also give um, those in the community the ability to reinvest in their own properties um, and to attract um, entrepreneurs and also other businesses that have our vision for the community of preserving the history and economic prosperity for those that live there. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a fantastic plan and, and it feeds into that concept of catalytic um, opportunities and the, the structures that we want to engage in provide that. Um, you know, and I, I would also say right now, you're not hearing a lot of nonprofits out there, and I'm, I'm pleased to say this, that are going after some really big projects, right? I mean, we're in the middle of an economic downturn. We're all cordoned off into our homes, and we're going to do this as safely as we obviously can and are, are legally allowed to and move with the appropriate steps. But this, for Preservation Maryland, is a statement about the role that preservation can play in the coming recovery, that we can't afford to retreat right now, and that our communities and places like Jonathan Street are going to need this kind of impact and investment more than ever before. So it would be easy for us as an organization and probably safer for us as an organization to say, now the pandemic came, um, downturn, we can't do it. But we've raised funds. Um, we haven't raised all of them, but we've raised funds and we feel like we can still move this project forward. Um, and we're doing that not only because Jonathan Street matters, which it does, but because we think that there needs to be a statement made that community revitalization matters moving forward. Um, and that um, places like Jonathan Street deserve to be revitalized and deserve this investment and need it more than ever before. Um, and right now the focus as it needs to be is on human health and safety, keeping people alive. But when that, that day turns and it will, um, that we're, it's time to put the economy back together, projects like this are gonna be critical. Um, and we've been getting some questions here now um, from our Facebook Live friends. And one of them is, 
what's going to happen with the property after rehab, which is a fantastic question. Good question. Um, and the plan, and, and Reggie can talk a little too about this, um, for a variety of reasons, which we can get into, is to take this property and um, turn um, it, rehabilitate it back into um, uh, residential use, which is what it's zoned for, what it has been used for since its creation, um, and create owner-occupied affordable housing. Um, and owner-occupied is a critical component of that because this allows people to build equity um, in their community. Um, they're not leasing it, they're not renting it. Um, the goal is to establish home ownership for somebody who needs it. And we're gonna be working with a qualified local nonprofit to manage that sale, because that's not something we do. We're gonna rehab it, we're gonna work with a nonprofit to place somebody in there who, um, who needs this and who this um, opportunity will present a great um, chance at building equity and investing in that community, in a community that needs more owner-occupied housing. Um, do you wanna talk about that at all, Reggie, and sort of, sort of the value of putting people back in the community who own it and who are rooted in it? Well, that lends itself to the economic empowerment that um, Terrence and I really talked about when we first met and started to partner. Um, you know, home ownership within the community, building that sense of pride um, so that as properties change hands over the generations that there is wealth that is to be passed on uh, within the community. Um, because, you know, wealth has been extracted from this community over the years, and we're looking to rebuild that. And the opportunity to take on this project is a seed that we're planting to much larger things that we would like to do in regards to bringing economic development back to the community. And also, you know, part of the goal is to make sure we honor the homeowner uh, because his, him and his family um, lived in this home for nearly 100 years. Um, so we want to respect that legacy and tell the story um, because he's an amazing man. And I hope that we get an opportunity to, um, once COVID-19 has passed us or passed us by, to, to interview him and, and hear his story as well. Yeah. I just want to reset the scene here for folks who maybe who just joined us a little bit um, but uh, since we started here. But I'm Nick Redding. I'm the Executive Director of Preservation Maryland. We're a nonprofit um, historic Preservation Organization formed back in 1931 uh, in the depths of another economic downturn. So we're no strangers to that. Um, and I'm joined here by um, Reggie Turner, um, who, in addition to being a local businessman, as we've heard, is helping to establish um, and has actually incorporated the Western Maryland Community Development Corporation, which has been incorporated and is on its way to becoming a nonprofit. It's a process. And Preservation Maryland is providing um, all the support it can and, and fiscal sponsorship as well for any grants that they're going to be going after before they get that um, official nonprofit status. This is a way that an established organization like Preservation Maryland can provide support and kind of uh, give birth to good new organizations, which we critically need partners like that out there. So Reggie is both a partner as an individual, partner as an organization, partner as a businessman. Um, and we have a lot of other partners and, um, you know, I think both of us would admit that, um, it takes a huge team to make these things happen. So obviously Terrence Moore, um, has been critically important in, in bringing this to fruition and will be important throughout the whole process, as well as folks like Lynn Bowman, who have done a lot of tr a tremendous documentation and research. Um, and so here on Giving Tuesday now, we're raising funds for this project and really for the pro historic property redevelopment program in general. Um, we've pulled together a lot of funds to make this thing a reality. Uh, and we're trying to raise an additional $30,000 starting today throughout all of Preservation Month, which we're in now, um, to really jumpstart this program and allow us to take on even more projects like this important Jonathan Street project. Um, and again, I mentioned before, the plan is to acquire it later this month. Closing is on May 26th. We've had to push it back a few times um, because of different, you can imagine uh, buying an old building. There's a lot of um, project uh, issues associated with it, getting surveys done and title insurance. And um, obviously a pandemic, we didn't, we didn't plan on that. That pushed us back a little bit. 
but we are geared up and ready to do that. Um, and that's going to be an exciting day for the organization. Um, and so again, we're here talking about this important new acquisition. Um, you know, Reggie, before we conclude here today, maybe tell us a little bit about your vision for Jonathan Street, what you hope to see, you know, maybe 10 years from now, 15 years from now, what does Jonathan Street look like? And, and what is your sort of lofty big picture hope for a place like this? Well, within the community, um, you know, as you, as you keep alluding to Lynn Bowman's book, uh, and her book for those that are watching is, uh, you can see that, 10 Weeks on Jonathan Street. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of rich history that's been lost uh, within the community. And her book is really a reference book. And it's a resource for a lot more uncovering to do. Um, we, we want to bring back a lot of the elements that m made this rich community what it was. We, you know, where appropriate, we would like to have entrepreneurs be able to come back within the community. Um, we would like to have the opportunity for the economic development to benefit those, uh, uh, the descendants of those that made this community, you know, what it was. Um, you know, within this community, there's also the, the Robert W. Johnson Community Center. Uh, we would like to see revitalization of that community center. We were able to advocate and work with the center to receive $100,000 from the Maryland Commission on African American History and Culture, uh, the African American Preservation Grant Program uh, to revitalize the pool. You know, that pool um, was the only place where African Americans could swim. Um, and things like that. So we we would like a total overhaul of the community where um, there's economic development, we're bringing pride back in. Um, those that are from that community and beyond have a place to come to. You know, we also look at the tourism side of things with, you know, 300,000 plus people coming to Washington County for Antietam Battlefield. You really can't complete that story of the Civil War had been there before um, without the Jonathan Street community. Um, and, and its importance and the role that African Americans spent in building this community. Um, so we, we want to preserve that history, we want to celebrate these stories, uh, and we, we want to make it good for those um, that live there. Yeah, it's a fantastic vision. It's something we obviously as an organization at Preservation Maryland have bought into completely. We believe it. And we think it speaks to the highest value and, and really where preservation should be. Right, we're moving in this direction and, and preservation has a long history and some good legacy, some bad legacy, but places like this are where we can really deploy preservation in such a way that it allows communities to build, to create a more just, equitable future and use fantastic historic resources like that cabin at 417 North Jonathan Street um, that we're planning on acquiring, rehabilitating, and then selling for owner-occupied affordable housing um, to not only be a catalytic moment, but also one thing that really got me very early on that you and I talked about is that this neighborhood, like many others, needs a win. And um, in, in, in light of what's going on in our world right now, we all need wins. We all need positivity. And so our message that we want to bring on Giving Tuesday is don't give us money to keep the lights on. Don't give us money because you feel bad for us. Give us money and invest in this program and in this opportunity because you believe in the power of preservation, because you wanna see communities like Jonathan Street get a win, um, because you wanna invest in an organization that refuses to retreat and is instead doubling down on the work that it believes in and the relevance of its work to communities, um, both in Hagerstown and all across um, the state. So we are extremely excited to be working with you. Um, you can go to our website at presmd.org. There's information there about Jonathan Street, information about this new program. Uh, obviously, you can click the Donate Now button if you want to donate through our website. You can donate here on Facebook. Uh, you can write us a check. Uh, you can send us cash in the mail. No, don't do that. But you can do it any way that you want. Um, and I know as soon as um, the CDC is stand, stood up as a nonprofit as well, we're going to be sharing that information so that you can support this important work. And um, Reggie and I have already been talking about 
how we can kind of jumpstart that project because that's an important component of this is that if this is truly to be catalytic we need to make sure that there's an organization there um, that can kind of pick up and run with it um, because preservation maryland does a good job of jumpstarting things but we can't be all things to all people and we depend on strong local partners which is why we're so excited to be working with reggie um, any parting words anything else you want to share or thoughts uh, here today and giving tuesday with us reggie um, I, I just wanted to say thank you to some some folks in the community and beyond. You know, Ron Lida was really instrumental in really letting me know the historic value of this of this cabin um, early on, and it took a, it took a while for it to catch hold with me, but it it finally did. Uh, and what his organization has done, um, Professor Lynn Bowman, for her to drop everything of what she was doing and spend ten weeks doing this research in the midst of us um making the case for the Jonathan Street community was very instrumental um also uh, Dr Emily Amp in, in regards to what she has contributed uh as well has been uh amazing and just the team that I have around me I, I mean I'm here as the face today but you know there, there are smarter people than me that are not on camera today and and those gentlemen have really you know come together it's you know it's so that we can fulfill this vision so I just want to say thank you to all the guys of the Western Maryland Community Development Corporation. And I have to thank my wife uh, and, and my girls because, you know, from the conference calls to running out and taking away from family time to do community things, it would never happen without them. So thank you. Yeah. No, I think I think it's a great place to end because none of this work could be done without the teams behind us. I obviously am just the the person that they put out front at Preservation Maryland, but we've got a fantastic team at Preservation Maryland from our fundraising side to the communications team, to our advocacy, to the operations and programmatic, it all works together. Um, and so we have a fantastic team. And th for those of you who are familiar with Preservation Maryland, you probably interacted with them, whether you've talked to Jessica on the grant side, Ellie in Annapolis, um, Megan on communications, Victoria with fundraising, or. Jana, who's the glue that keeps it all together, Jermaine doing our workforce development work. Um, we um, you know, really have a fantastic team that we pulled together and we have a great board behind us. And I should mention that those three companies that provided the pro bono services to get us to this point, uh, are, they're all board members as well. Um, so our board has really stepped up in a big way and we hope that our members will join us here on um, the beginning of preservation month. What a great way to kick it off not just talking about preservation, but we're going to do it because our communities need it and we can't afford to retreat. Um, Reggie, it's a pleasure as always talking with you uh, and look forward to updating people as we move forward, as we close on this building and then as we break ground um, and really begin the physical work of catalyzing Jonathan Street. Um, thank you again for joining us and thanks to all of our members for listening in today. Thanks, Nick. <laughs>